go, go ahead. All right. Thank you so much, Momita, the organizers and the audience. Um, so I, I've been a big fan of the BPB seminar for some time now. So I am an assistant professor in physics at the University of California in Merced. And here are some experimental images uh, that have recently motivated my work. And as you can see, they span all scales from, or different scales, not all scales, from uh, <clears throat> cell biomaterials to single cells in culture to tissue. So I'm a theorist. I work in soft matter and biological physics theory. And I also wanted to make a plug for the SLAM seminar series, which I co-run. And this is exclusively for postdoc speakers. So if you are a postdoc and want to talk about soft matter and biophysics, please uh, sign up to speak. <clears throat> also, uh, this is the somewhat ambitious title of my talk. I will show you today how cells use mechanical communication to optimally network. But since I'm a uh, theorist, I might as well add this disclaimer because I'm going to show this works in principle and I'm going to show you some evidence from the existing experimental literature. And also we are going to make some testable predictions, but I hope that this work will stimulate further experiments which can uh, demonstrate this idea in a specific system. Okay, so with that disclaimer in mind, this is uh, the outline of my talk. I will start with an introduction to this broad area of cell mechanics. Then I will introduce a minimal physical model which can let us think about uh, in intercellular mechanical interactions in elastic media. Then I will show how this uh, model leads to the self-organization of cells into multicellular networks purely through mechanical interactions. And then we will see how this network morphology can be tuned by the substrate mechanics. And then finally, I will conclude with a discussion of possible applications to the engineering of vascular networks and also how this leads to uh, bio-inspired physics, that is the active matter uh, behavior with uh, long range interactions that come from elasticity. So this field of uh, one of the pioneering experiments in this field of mechanobiology comes from Stopak and Harris from the 1980s, which is somewhat prehistoric in terms of the history of this very new field. And what they did was this cultured cells on top of a thin rubber sheet and showed that cells actually exert forces on their surroundings and deform and wrinkle this rubber sheet. So at the time, this did not receive much uh, attention from biologists because it seemed kind of obvious, well, cells do need to exert forces to do some functions like migrate or change their shape, such as during cell division. And in some cases, it's very important like muscle contraction, but so on. So this field sort of exploded around two decades ago with several experiments. One of the key experiments was this one that I'm pointing at by Engler and Disher, who showed that by culturing stem cells on top of soft substrates and purely by varying the mechanical properties, specifically the rigidity of the substrate, you could affect the cell fate. So this relates to a previous talk where we saw cell fate changes, but here it's purely through mechanical means or the only thing that is being changed in these different experiments is the substrate rigidity. And what they showed was that on soft substrates, the cells tend to become neurons, on hard substrates, they become bone cells and muscles on substrates of intermediate stiffness. So this of course is biologically very remarkable, but then this led to a host of other experiments um, and more, what is more relevant to our talk is that the structural order of cells as shown in this particular example, we are looking at polarized cells and the stress fibers inside the cells and how they're orientationally ordered. And what this experiment, again, from the Disher lab showed uh, was that the ordering or extent of ordering is actually a function of substrate stiffness. And in fact, the fibers order best on an intermediate substrate stiffness. They don't order as well on very soft or very stiff substrates. So there is now an accumulated body of evidence that cells do care about their mechanical environment. So they pull on their surroundings to sense the rigidity and, to, and then they respond to the mechanical cues from the surrounding environment. So this, uh, these experiments were all single cell, but what about multicellular behavior and does this have any implications for morphogenesis? So one particular system that we are excited by is the morphogenesis of blood vessels, which starts with these endothelial cells, which are sort of all randomly placed in the beginning, but then they can 
cluster with each other, they form these gaps, and then that finally leads to the formation of blood vessels. Now, these endothelial cells, when cultured on top of hydrogel substrates, as was done in this famous Dishard experiment, show something interesting. They can, depending on the substrate stiffness, they can organize into networks, but as shown by these two different experiments, so the top one comes from uh, the Reinhardt King lab, uh, and this one comes from a group in Germany, by Rudiger and Schaller. So in the first experiment, they showed that the cells actually prefer to form networks on stiffer substrates. That is, these numbers here, these are the sub substrate stiffness in kilopascal. So here, and on the softer substrates, they don't form networks, whereas on the stiffer substrates, they do. Whereas in this second, more recent experiment, they show that the cells um, actually form, prefer to form networks on the softer substrates, like 0.5 or 1 kilopascal, but here they don't on, on stiffer substrates. So this depends on other things apart from the substrate stiffness, such as the uh, chemistry of the matrix, and we will uh, talk about that as well a little bit. But uh, the main questions that we are asking in our research is how do these cells find each other in the first place, which apparently is not so well understood even now. And then the second question is why does the network organization depend so sensitively on the substrate stiffness? So a uh, little bit of background on this, which may not be necessary for a lot of the people in the BPPB audience, but a lot of these experiments are with cells that are adhered to a, a soft substrate. So here in this cartoon, we can see the cell with its internal cytoskeleton, and then it makes these adhesions through proteins like integrin with some <clears throat> sort of uh, ligands that cover that are used to cover or coat this hydrogel substrate things like uh, collagen or fibronectin to which the cell can adhere. Um, and, 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 and the cell cytoskeleton is essentially it's force generating machinery, which we need to uh, talk about a little bit to understand how the cells exert forces as shown in this cartoon on their underlying uh, substrate. So as shown in this famous uh, image, we can see uh, the cytoskeleton is a network of polymers that provides the structural integrity to the cell and its key functions include force generation and transport uh, inside the cell. So uh, the two key processes of force generation to keep in mind, which are both active because they require the consumption of chemical fuel in the form of ATP, is that of the molecular motor myosin and the polymerization of actin itself. So on the left here, which is what directly concerns us in this work, is that myosin motor filaments are uh, shown in this cartoon as this, this green sort of bipolar double-headed monster. It is, it's, it's made of many uh, individual myosin molecular motors whose heads are clustered at the two ends. And so when they find actin filaments in this uh, canonical anti-parallel configuration, the motors will walk towards the plus end of the filaments and produce uh, contractile motion of these filaments, which in the mechanics world can be modeled or thought of as a force dipole, a pair of equal and opposite forces that are separated by some distance. And also, uh, uh, these actin can, filaments can polymerize and exert pushing forces on the membrane, which becomes more important for motile cells, but will be less important for us here because we are mainly talking about cells that really adhere to the substrate and uh, exert strong contractile forces on it through this actomyosin molecular machinery. Now, what about cell-cell interaction? So there is also some evidence that cells can talk to each other through their mutual mechanical deformations of the underlying substrate. So here we can see uh, two cardiomyocytes, which is heart muscle cells, which can synchronize their beating, even though they're placed some distance apart, one or two cell lengths apart. And this was dramatically shown first by Tahir Saif's lab and then uh, in, explored in more detail uh, by, uh, um, Shelley Sleet's lab in the Technion, where what they did was they cultured a cardiac myocyte on top of the substrate. And then instead of using a second cell, they actually use a mechanical probe to sort of indent the substrate and stretch it in a cyclic manner. And what they showed was that an initially quiescent cardiac myocyte can actually pick, uh, synchronize with this mechanical probe and start beating with the same frequency. So this uh, conclusively demonstrates that it's not just chemical signaling between two cells that causes them to get synchronized, but replacing the cell with a purely mechanical probe has the same effect. 
Now, in other contexts also, for example, in the case of endothelial cells, this old experiment also from Reinhard King shows that to a pair of cells, the way they interact will depend on their substrate stiffness. So for example, on soft substrates, they're shown to make contacts repeatedly over a long time, whereas on stiffer substrates, they will sort of move away effectively repelling each other. Now, all these experiments were on hydrogels, which are synthetic substrates and are kind of linearly elastic. But uh, real cells inside in vivo, they live on extracellular matrix that are fibrous, they're, that are made of collagen. And this experiment from uh, uh, Guru Chandran Ravi Swami's lab at, in Caltech shows that on such fibrous matrices, cells can actually reorganize the fibers around them by pulling on them. And then two cells can create such fibrous tethers between them and then extend or spread along these fibers to move, move towards each other. So, uh, and, and in such nonlinear matrices, you can in fact have longer range force transmission than linear substrates. So all these experiments show you that between two cells that are not directly in contact, they can still communicate with each other mechanically and uh, either get attracted or repelled depend, depending on the circumstances. All right, so now coming to our model, um, so the way we, uh, so this, uh, the inspiration for this way of modeling goes back to SLV's theory in elasticity for inclusion. So imagine having some material and cutting a hole in it, this elliptical region can be thought of as a hole. And then think about pushing in another piece of material, maybe a different material with a different size and shape into this hole. So you're kind of forcing this hole uh, to change its shape to accommodate this and you're creating some stress in the material uh, and this idea was adapted uh, to, by uh, uh, Schwartz and Safran to the case of adherent cells in elastic media. So the cells are model, thought of here as inclusions that are producing some stress on the underlying elastic material. And as I said, the coarse grain model uh, for this can be thought of as a coarse dipole because the cell has all these internal contractile machinery from its actomyosin elements. And if it is a polarized cell, like shown in this cartoon, that is like a main axis, I can, we can think of the force distribution as being like one big dipole, like shown here. And then uh, especially physics students might like to think of this analogy with electrostatics. The deformation that is produced in a linear elastic medium by an elastic dipole is very similar to that of an electric dipole. So the uh, strain field, like the electric field will decay as one over distance cubed. But because this dipole has is, is a second rank tensor rather than uh, that rather than a vector, the orientational dependence of this dipole will be more like an electric quadrupole, as we will show in some cartoons below. But as far as interactions is concerned, this idea gives rise to this uh, or this gives this appealing idea that uh, two dipoles which are mutually deforming the matrix can actually talk to each other through the matrix. And that can be written down as a mechanical interaction energy, so uh, which is which is which is the coupling of the um, the stress that that is created by one dipole one with the strain field that is created by the other dipole two. And so, uh, minimizing this potential will lead to some forces and torques on the dipole, which we can think of as the force that the substrate is pushing one dipole with. Uh, in the presence of the strain of the other. And because these are compressive or contractile dipoles, they, can, they will tend to reduce the energy of the medium by going to regions that are stretched uh, where they can reduce the deformation energy. And this, the experimental, uh, this, is, this is basically an analog for what really happens in experiments, which is that cells will align their uh, long axis along the direction of maximal stretch. Uh, this idea was generalized to nonlinear elastic media uh, by nonlinear elastic media by Yair Shokep and others, but I will focus on linear elastic media. So this work was done by a very good graduate student, Patrick Knorr, and uh, he these are the simulations and results that I'll be talking about are from him. So as with any kind of physical dipole, we know that the interaction between a pair of dipoles will not only depend on their separation distance, but also on their relative orientations. So we can write down an interaction potential that is like an electric dipole-dipole interaction, where P is the dipole moment, E is the elastic uh, modulus or the Young's modulus of the substrate, R is the distance between them. And then there is a complicated functional dependence on these angular orientations. To give you insight onto this angular dependence, 
will show you these potential maps. So imagine having a fixed dipole at the center, which is contracting along the x-axis, then your medium gets stretched in these blue regions and it gets compressed in the red regions. So if I place a second test dipole here, it's going to be either attracted or repelled depending on whether it's in the blue region or in the red region, which is shown in this movie here. So they get strongly attracted along the x-axis, but along the y-axis, there is like a weak repulsion. But this also depends on this other interesting parameter in linear elasticity theory, which is the Poisson's ratio. So when the matrix is com compressible, it will look like this, but when it is incompressible, then there are these additional uh, stretched regions which will change the way in which two, the two dipoles interact. So along the x-axis, they'll still be attracting, but they'll also be attracting along the y-axis because of these additional blue regions. So this will become important for us uh, later on. But how do we go from two cells to many cells? So this is where uh, Patrick comes in and he collaborates with uh, Ajay Gopinathan's group here who have been looking at for some time with these agent-based models for cell migration. So we simplify the cell, abstract it out as like a, uh, stick as, as a disk which is moving on a 2D surface because these experiments are often done on top of hydrogel substrates and each cell is endowed with a dipole moment which is given by this black line axis and then we think about uh, the like a vector in which the cell is pointing and we can write down it's both its translational and rotational equations of motion so very quickly the cell has several forces acting on it, but the main force here is this elastic interaction force, which is operating within this uh, uh, sort of radius of interaction, because we assume that beyond a few cell lengths away, the cell, the strains will be too weak to affect the, these cells. But we also, for numerical uh, practicalities, we don't let the cells sit on top of each other. So we have some steric springs to enforce that. And the cell's motion, like the cells can tend to spread towards each other in some stochastic way. So all the stochasticity is modeled as, as, as a diffusion constant, both in translation and rotation. And this is the torque that comes from the elastic potential. So the dipole-dipole interaction is giving us both a force and, and, and a torque. And so th these equations can be non-dimensionalized and there is like one important non-dimensional parameter which is the strength of these elastic interactions divided by the effective temperature, which represents the uh, noisy movements of the cell. And this represents the sort of systematic directed movements of the cell. And we can estimate all this parameter from uh, measurements in the literature. So we know from traction force experiments, how much forces the cells produce, what their typical sizes are. But this uh, parameter can of course vary within a certain reasonable range because uh, different cells exert different types of force. And also you can make it vary in experiments by varying this elastic modulus. So on a stiffer substrate, the A value will get, tend to get reduced, for example. So what do these model simulations look like? So what Patrick does is he takes a bunch of these model cells and he sort of anneals them, starts with a high noise so that the it's not trapped in some metastable configuration. And so we see them sort of jostling around and uh, you'll see that the dipole is marked here with some yellow arrows, which will become clearer when the movie slows down. And so over time, as the noise is lowered, the cells seem to align with each other, uh, with their neighbors, and then form these uh, extensive network-like structures. So if you think about it, uh, this is probably not surprising. There is a lot of interest in soft matter physics going back to Pincus and Bijen in what the thermodynamic phases of dipolar fluids should be. So they were thinking of something like ferrofluids. So these are these tiny magnets which align with each other end to end, but because of entropy, like multiple chains can intersect with each other and form junctions and so on. And then Kluski and Safran in this famous paper in 2000, they predicted with mean field theory that such dipolar systems can phase separate into like a dense liquid-like region, which is rich in junctions and a gas-like region, which is rich in open ends. But then there have been simulation papers such as this one in PRL, which did extensive simulation, large-scale simulations and did not find any evidence for this phase transition. And their argument was that rings come in and spoil this phase transition. So there's a whole lot of exciting stories there, but today we are not going to look at these thermodynamic phases because we are motivated by biology. So we will look at a, a small number of cells, like a few hundred cells in some uh, region. 
And we will run these simulations over some physiological time scale. And what Patrick finds after sweeping through the parameter space is all these is this phase diagram of simulation snapshots. So on the x-axis is this important parameter, the effective elastic interaction, which tells us how strong the elastic interactions are relative to the noise. On the y-axis is the number or the density of cells. So as you can see, when the elastic interaction is very small, like 0.1, uh, these exist in a gas-like phase. As you dial this up, the cells will line up because they're dipoles and form these chains. If there is high enough density, these chains will intersect with each other and form these networks. And this is shown for a lower value of the Poisson's ratio. So this is for a more compressible matrix. And the lower one is for an incom incompressible matrix. And you can see that in both cases, if the A is strong enough, the elastic interaction, and if there are enough number of cells, they will both give you networks. But there are some interesting qualitative differences between the microstructural features of these networks that we will get into in a slide or two. But before that, I just want to relate this picture to experiments. So in experiments such as this one from Ladoux's lab in, in Paris, people, uh, people find that the cell force, uh, the cells actually adapt their force to the stiffness of their mechanical environment. So here, the x-axis is the stiffness of the substrate. On the y-axis is the average force exerted by the cell. On softer substrates, cells do not exert much force. As the stiffness increases, the cell is able to spread more, make stronger additions, and it, is, it exerts more force till the force saturates. And so this can be empirically modeled or written down in this form. The dipole moment uh, it will depend on the uh, substrate stiffness through this relation, where this E star is a characteristic substrate stiffness at which the cell force saturates. And this allows us to map our the ele effective elastic interaction in our model to the substrate stiffness. And what this tells us is uh, very easy to explain on, on soft, uh, softer substrates, uh, the cells just do not pull much. And so the deformations are small. And, and, and on stiffer substrates, even if the cells are pulling a lot, the substrate is harder to deform. So in both cases, the elastic interaction is uh, become small at, at, at very soft or very stiff substrates because our elastic interactions depend on the deformations. And, and, and they reach some maximum at some optimal substrate stiffness, which is in fact this E star value. And here we are just showing curves for different possible E stars, which is a property of that particular cell and can depend on other things like matrix chemistry. Okay, so what does this tell us about experiments? So remember, we started you by showing started by showing you two different experiments by by two different groups, and they saw opposing opposite differences or dependencies on substrate stiffness, but now our results can reconcile this because what we are saying is that uh, there is some optimal stiffness at which the interactions are maximum, which will let the cells form networks. Whereas if the stiffness is too, too low or too high, the interactions are too small and the noise dominates and the cells are not able to form these networks. So that's uh, uh, the first takeaway. Second, what Patrick does is this is, uh, he measures the percolation probability in these different networks which is a measure of how space spanning these networks are. So uh, in each network, he looks for paths like this, which connect uh, one end of the box to the other while going through the cells. And he looks at uh, many such simulations and looks at the number of cases or the probability of finding or the fraction of cases in which you can find such paths. And here we plot it as a function of the cell density or the packing fraction in the simulation. And we see that for the dipolar interactions for both the cases that we tried, nu is equal to 0.1 and 0.5, remember nu is the Poisson ratio, we find that at very small densities, the cells are able to make this percolation transition to, going, to go from disconnected gas-like state to a connected network-like state. And to contrast with this, we did simulations for, um, uh, or Patrick did simulations for this system of diffusing sticky disks, which are, where, where, where the, the cells are just moving around and when they find each other, they just stick to each other and there are no dipolar interactions. And we see that here we need to go to much higher packing fraction to get this percolation transition. The percolation transition will also occur as a function of the elastic interaction strength. So here we fix the density and we vary the A parameter and then this is like the gas-like state and then at higher A we enter the network state. And then using our 
mapping from the previous slide, we can map the percolation probability to elastic modulus. And again, we find this optimal behavior where there is like a narrow back or there's a range of elastic stiffness in which it will percolate. And this, the width of this is controlled by uh, the number of cells, the N. So this is for a low number of cells. This is for a high number of cells, as well as the effective temperature. So this is for a lower effective temperature, it becomes wider. So those are the two lessons here that elastic dipoles can form percolating networks very efficiently. So if the cells were following a strategy where they did not have these substrate mediated interactions, but they were just randomly moving around and then bumping into each other to form these clusters, that would not be so efficient because you would need many more cells to actually form these networks. And then also the network formation happens over a wider range of uh, substrate stiffness if the noise is low and if there are uh, more number of cells, as you might expect. So then we went ahead and looked at some of the uh, morphological features of these networks. So the first thing that Patrick did was look at the number of nearest neighbors of these. And I'll try to speed up because um, at the near, nearly at the end. And, and, and here he finds uh, that the neighbor count increases both with uh, the elastic interaction strength and the packing fraction. But there is this interesting difference between the two Poisson's ratios. So the new is equal to 0.5 case has many more neighbors than new is equal to 0.1. To understand why this is the case, we'll remind you how these networks look very different. So here on the, on the bottom, we have the new is equal to 0.5 networks. You can see that they have uh, many of these shorter rings, whereas at new is equal to 0.1, uh, they form these longer branches and bigger rings. And to explain why this is the case, uh, this has also been studied by Bishops and Schwartz, but Patrick did these simulations by confining the cells on a lattice and now they're not free to translate, but they can only rotate. And here in new is equal to 0 0.1, they will form this perfectly nematic alignment, whereas here they will form this kind of anti nematic alignment, which will lead to these smaller rings. So this is what is showing up in the off lattice simulations as well. The two uh, cases have very different ground states. And then we look at uh, more morphological features that could be related to the transport function of the network like the average branch length, the distribution of branch lengths. And we find that on the lower news, the branch lengths are longer and can are more tunable, whereas at higher new, they're insensitive and, and to the elastic interaction strengths. And, 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 and we, can, we also explored the robustness, which is a kind of reverse percolation, like we remove bonds from the network and see how the largest cluster si connected cluster size decreases. Okay, so I will uh, uh, conclude with the final message, which is that uh, what, how is this applicable to tissue engineering? So the holy grail of tissue engineering is to be able to grow organs on a dish. And you can read this fascinating populist science account by Philip Ball on this, uh, but a viable tissue beyond a certain size requires blood vessels for transport of nutrients and oxygen. And we are showing that by manipulating mechanical environment, you can help to form these networks. And of course, our model is very minimal because it focused on only mechanics, but we know that a lot of biochemical factors are involved in biology. But by doing this, we hope to entangle the mechanical factors. We also talked about, uh, we showed some design principles of these networks and we can think about what the uh, cost and the uh, robustness of these networks are. So this relates to Eleni Katipuri's work on, on, on our ideas on how networks are optimized to uh, for cost and robustness. And then we can include further mechanical effects that we have ignored in our present model. And then the predictions for experiments are that there is an optimal stiffness for network formation. And really there should be more experiments exploring these pairwise cell interactions where we measure both some structural metrics as well as the traction forces. So um, I like to conclude by thanking my collaborators and my group members. So the work I showed you was done by Patrick but here are the other group members and their projects and also the funding agencies. And thank you for your attention. Thank you, Kinjal, for a wonderful talk. So there are a few questions and I will start with the questions in the chat. So uh, uh, the first question is, uh, do you consider the hydrodynamic interactions between cells in the model? No, we are in fact considering the elastic analog of that. So we are considering the elastic interactions between the cell, which is very similar to hydrodynamic interactions because these cells kind of live on a solid substrate and are crawling on top of that. They're not swimming, right? 
Okay. And the second question is, can you say what kind of Poisson ratio compressibility we can expect in biological tissues? Yeah, this is a wonderful question. So there are some differences between the synthetic hydrogel substrates that people use in experiments, which are uh, more or less incompressible. So we would expect the Poisson's ratio to be 0.5 or close to that, above 0.3. Whereas in the biological tissue, it's made of fibers. So it is a nonlinear material and there the Poisson's ratio can be much lower. And in, interestingly, it can also show time dependent effects because these are uh, gels so over longer times, the water can flow out, there can be poroelastic effects and this can reduce the compressibility of the matrix. So we think that both these regimes can be valid in different circumstances. All right, so I will ask while folks think about other questions, I will ask a question I have uh, of my own, you know. So uh, so when you talk about the percolation probability, are you thinking of con like just connectivity, you know, or conductivity, or are you thinking of rigidity, right? Because you talk about mechanical communication. So I wasn't sure when you meant percolation, is it just, you know, con connectivity percolation or, or, or rigidity? Because yes, so the thresholds for those will be different, right? Yeah, so that's a great question. This Here we are focusing purely on the structural uh, connectivity of the network, okay, okay, not okay. on the... We not have mechanical about, stress transfer, not mechanical stress transfer. Just that's right, uh, because the mechanics here comes mainly from the substrate and not right, from right. the cells which are connecting up. Right. Having said that, it will be very interesting to analyze these networks in terms of how different those thresholds are. And the other question I had is you looked into, you know, how when you have these active force dipoles versus you just have sticky disks, how, how the thresholds are different. Have you looked at the role of the substrate itself, right? So, you know, I, I presume substrate versus no substrate also has a big effect. Or I guess no substrate will basically have no interactions because your interactions are mediated through the substrate. Yes, exactly. So, so the sticky disk is like that. There are no substrate mediated interactions. Okay, okay. So when you say sticky disks, it's just disks with sticky interaction, no substrate. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so this is modeling the idea that cells can contact each other and form adhesions between cells uh, and, and then just form a network that way. But we yeah. are saying that that would not be so efficient. Yeah, and I, I presume that the percolation threshold itself is, you know, just based on constraints, et cetera. But like, if you change the strength of your substrate, right, how does the shape of the curve change? Or does oh, so that... this is what we are showing in this smaller graph. So okay. the, this is percolation probability versus the strength of the elastic interaction Okay. at, at a certain packing fraction. Okay. So here we, we, this percolation also happens as a function of uh, not just the packing fraction, but also the interaction strength. So there are two parameters can, that can make you go through this percolation transition. Okay, okay. All right, let's see if there are other questions from others. I don't want to hog all of the question time. And I'm also happy, I, I'll also stop the recording at this point.